Welcome to the Foundations of Learning podcast, where we believe every child deserves a tailored and enriching educational experience. By embracing diverse perspectives and sharing practical tips, I hope to inspire you to actively participate in your child's learning journey, fostering a love for knowledge and nurturing the skills necessary for success in a rapidly changing world. Let's get started. Welcome back to the Foundations of Learning. Today, we are going to talk about learning time and how you can find success because Let's be honest, learning time can often be a breeze or it can be like pulling out teeth, right? Learning time is essential to find success in what they're learning for that day because if it feels like a jumbled mess, they feel stressed or you feel stressed or you're frustrated or they're frustrated it can get a little dicey and no learning is going to happen if we're both not in the right mindset, both being the teacher and the student. These are some tips that I'm going to give you based on my years of experience teaching kids and just how I found success in learning time because like I said, there can be times where maybe the child is just not feeling it that day or maybe you're not feeling it that day, right? And if that's the case and you're homeschooling or something like that, like maybe take some take a break. Go do something that you both enjoy, something that you can bond with because if you can create that bond, it will help in that learning time just because they're feeling happy at that point in time, right? You've done something fun with them. All right, so... <clears throat> There was some shifts that I made because in the beginning when I was teaching, um, I was doing like the very basics of what classroom management is, what they teach you in college of what you should be doing. And it was a very like extrinsic reward system that I had. And that just stops working. After a certain amount of time, extrinsic stuff just does not work. And it doesn't work for every child. Some kids could, they literally don't care. Like if you give them a reward, they don't care. If you give them a consequence, they don't care. Like it has to be from within them on whether or not they want to do said thing. Um, And so I kind of had a shift in my management style and I started basing it more on intrinsic motivation more than the extrinsic. I still had um, extrinsic things in place, but it was a very like intrinsic motivation, um, I guess, path I went down. And so my number one thing is to think about what kind of management style you have or parenting style that you have, you know, and really look at if that is actually going to be helpful in their learning time. Like I said, every child is different and you might have three kids and with those three kids, you're going to have to parent them very differently. I mean, I had, um, you know, multiple siblings in classes and I can definitely vouch for the fact that not all siblings are the exact same and how you deal with them is not the same. So, really think about that as well. The shift that I made is that the student and I had a mutual understanding that I would always understand their feelings. I would always help them through the hard tasks and that their beliefs and ideas mattered. Like they mattered. As a person, they mattered. And they knew that I really did believe that. Like it didn't matter who it was in my classroom. I had a talk with all of my students that I care for them, I'm here to help them, and that I am understanding of their beliefs and their um, ideas. So that is like a big piece too, is just like even them knowing that like you're not just an authority figure that's always going to tell them what to do, right? Like you're also somebody that they can rely on. Um, I also created rules with my students. So we would sit down and be like, okay, for learning time. What do you think we should or how we should behave during our learning time? And so I had the kids think and some of them would start to get silly and they're like, "Mm, you know, we're going to scream the whole time. And then we would talk about it. We're like, okay, let's say we can scream the entire, you know, learning time. What will happen if that, if we do that? And they started to realize like, oh, well, if people are screaming, I'm not going to be able to focus, you know? So then we came to the conclusion of, well, we can't be screaming. We can talk to one another, but it has to be in a quiet voice so that others can focus, right? So really talking about why we have these rules, not just here's your rule, this is what we're doing, and this is why we're doing it. You have to like really 
involve them in that because then they take ownership of those rules. It's not just something somebody's telling them to do. Now they were also a part of creating these rules. They understand why we have these rules and it just it just causes a ripple effect of that intrinsic motivation that I was talking about because now they have ownership of it. Their number two is having all of the materials ready before the lesson. If you think, all right, I'm just gonna kind of wing it, don't do that because if you're going to wing a lesson, um, unless you're really, really good at winging stuff, which let's be honest, it's so much easier and your kids are going to be more engaged. They're going, you're going to be able to have a quick pace so you can get it done quickly. Um, and there's no time for them to mess around because you're, you know, trying to find a certain material or a word or whatever it is. It's going to be easier if you just have everything you need beforehand. And believe me, I've definitely been that teacher where I like, you know, think I have all my materials and then I go to do my lesson. I'm like, oh crap, I don't have whatever. And let me tell you, it throws the whole entire rhythm off because now I have to get up. I have to go and grab the resource, come back, bring them back in, you know, focus them up again. So if you can have everything you need ready before you even start a lesson, it's going to make things go so much smoother. All right, so the next thing is transparency and clear expectations. And this is kind of going off of what I had said um, as far as, you know, um, shifting my management style and having them understand, like, that I, you know, validate their feelings and we're going to help each other and things like that. And also, like, the creating of the rules, but really being as transparent and clear as you can on your expectations is going to lead this lesson because if I don't start the lesson with my expectations every time like I there was not one time that I sat down and I did not relay my expectations no every single time at learning time we sat down and by a certain point they knew what my expectations were so I might even say what are our learning time expectations and they can tell me because I've told them so many times what the expectations are Um, And so what that might look like is maybe I say, okay, during our learning time, we're going to sit up straight and tall in our chair. We're going to try our very best and we're going to complete our work um, and we're going to participate in the lesson by raising our hands or, you know, like telling me answers, things like that, whatever. So whatever it is that your expectation is, you can even tell them what exactly you're going to be doing that day. So, you know, here are my learning time expectations for behavior. And then here's what we're going to do. You're going to read five AY words for me. You're going to spell five AY words for me. We're going to read a passage together. And then you're going to draw me a picture of what the passage was about or something like that. Right. So they They know what to expect. They know that once they're done with said skill, they get to move on and do whatever they want or whatever it was. So setting those clear expectations and having um, that transparency with them of what to expect and how they should be behaving is going to be super helpful. All right. So the next one is providing autonomy through choices. Choices are a great way to make your child feel like they're in control of that situation because I mean, really, let's be honest, like who wants to be told what to do all day, every day for everything, right? And that's what kids really do experience in a lot of their day is somebody telling them what to do all of the time. So if you can provide choices for them, They're going to feel like they have ownership and that's going to want that or make them want to be involved in in the learning time as well. And they're going to be willing to participate a little bit more in that. So now when we're allowing for choices, we're not just willy nilly giving them any choice whatsoever. No, you're going to give them two options. I wouldn't suggest more than two, but give them two different options that will always get you to the point or the goal of where you want to get to. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, So for example, if you are doing this with learning time, you could say, do you want to play first or do our lesson first? So now they get an option. They know that they're going to have to get to that lesson at some point. They're going to have to do it, but they get to choose. Are we going to play or are we going to do the lesson first? Which one? And then they get to choose and they know, okay, after this timer, you know, here's that, those 
that transparency and those clear expectations. When this timer goes off, your playtime is over and we're going to go to our learning time. And if that doesn't happen, here are the consequences of what will happen. And there is not an option for a lesson. We are going to get it done today. So really just setting those clear expectations with those questions if you have um, a child that's a little more strong-willed, things like that. Um, So another example would be, do you want to use markers or crayons to write with, right? We're still writing. Doesn't matter what you use, but we're still going to write. So now they get to choose and it's more fun for them because they're like, oh, I want to use this glittery marker or whatever. Makes it more fun. Do you want to build words with letter tiles or magnetic tiles, you know? So they can choose how they're building their words. You're still working on spelling, but they get a choice. Now it's super fun for them because they are feeling like they are a part of this lesson. Another example, do you want to work on reading in your room or in the kitchen, right? Let them choose. Or maybe do you want to work on your reading in the fort we just made or at the kitchen table or whatever it is. So let them choose the area that you're learning in. Um, Another example, do you want to read with words or spell with words first? So now we're looking at, I still, I'm always going to read and spell with words, but which one would you like to do first? Do you want to read this story or this story, right? And you might have a couple of stories that they can choose from that goes over the skill you're working on. And now they get to choose which it is that they're reading. And that just is going to engage them in their reading even more. And the very last example is, do you want to use a poppet or Play-Doh to tap our sounds? So either way, we're going to tap our sounds, but you get to choose the mode in which we are doing that. And so like I said, creating these choices just creates the autonomy. It gives them the ownership of the lesson. Now it's not just an authority figure telling them what they have to do, when they have to do it. They get to choose. And you could use all of those in one lesson, right? So you could Do you want to play first or read first? That's how we start off our lesson, right? Or whatever they want to do. They get to choose. Then do you want to, you know, use this this or this to write with? Do you want to use this or this to build your your words? Do you want to do your lesson here or here, right? Setting those before the lesson, like don't do it, like obviously like during the lesson, but having them choose all of those things before the lesson starts, right? Like we're going to do our reading lesson and ask them these questions and have all of the materials ready to go. Maybe they go gather them and they bring them to you and they're like, these are the materials we're using today, you know, but you're still getting to the same goal. All right. So the next one is mindset and mistakes. Now it's important that we have the right mindset ourselves as well as for our children. Because as a teacher, I have seen um, kids get some anxiety over not doing something correct because they tell me like, you know, my mom and dad say I have to do this correct every time or I need to get better at X, Y, and Z. or And those are all great that we want them to get better and we want them to succeed. But you also need to be okay with if they aren't 100% succeeding all the time because in reality that's not real life we're not going to succeed all the time 100% of the time where it takes time and the fact that we aren't succeeding in something means we just need extra practice and so that's the kind of mindset that I want you to have and that your child needs to have so that they can succeed because if they think that they have to be perfect to everything the very first time they are going to shut down and they're not going to want to learn at all because there is always that chance in learning that you're going to fail. And so for them, if they fail, they're disappointing someone. Maybe they feel like they're dumb or whatever it is. So you need to have the mindset that like, hey, guess what? You don't know that. That's great. Let's, I'll reteach it to you. I'm here to help you. Let's practice it and you will eventually get better. We'll do this together right? So making sure that you have that mindset. Um, And I just would discourage you from punishing them for not doing well on things. um, Just because like I said, it kind of shifts that mindset from being okay with failure, which you have to be when you're learning to I'm never going to try again because I'm going to be punished if I fail. And just imagine that like you as an adult, right? You learn a lot of new things in your life. And imagine if every time that you messed up, you were punished for it like that. (laughs) That's just not how it works, right? 
All right, so um, the next one we're going to talk about is don't help too much. Now, I know that it can be hard when you're trying to teach a kid something and you're, or your child and you're thinking like, I have to, you know, help them a lot so that I can make sure that they have it. But really, it's important that you obviously do the teaching, but most of it should be like, um, I actually saw something called like the 70... 2010 rule or something like that and it was like 70% of it should be experiences and them working through a problem on their own and then 20% of it was um I can't even remember exactly but like 10% of it was actually the teaching like only 10% of your lesson is you actually teaching and explicitly teaching them a skill the rest of it is going to be them practicing on their own and them um uh them practicing on their own and then you're just observing to see what holes they may still have and then you can provide specific and immediate feedback um, but that's as they are working on it and give them time kids actually need more time than you think so count to like five or ten in your head depending on what it is they're doing right so count in your head and give them time if they are trying to do it and they're trying to figure it out just wait And if they're, you know, after five to 10 seconds, they still don't get it, then you can say, okay, it looks like whatever it was they were doing, let's say they were sounding out a word incorrectly, right? Oh, it looks like you were saying that this, you know, this B sound as the D sound, right? We were thinking this is a D, but this is a B or whatever it is. So you're providing them feedback in the moment, but you're letting them also struggle through it. And that is one thing that I've noticed is, um, that oftentimes we want to just jump in really fast because it's really hard to watch somebody struggle through something. But that struggle is necessary if we want them to master a skill. All right, so the next one we're going to talk about is the importance of mood, tone, and attention. This is so critical, okay? If you, so for example, okay, let's say I'm teaching a lesson and I'm sitting all back and relaxed in my chair and just kind of like, okay, do this one. All right, great job. All right, let's do this one. Like I just sound bored, right? I sound bored. I'm sitting back. I look relaxed. No, you need to be like leaning forward. I would suggest you being directly in front of your child so like they are sitting on one end and I'm sitting on the other end or you're sitting on the floor and you're facing each other but I would make sure that you are facing them um you can be to the side of them but it's a lot better when you're face to face because for one it's just like that close intimate interaction there that you have when you're sitting across from someone and also when you're leaning forward and you're like really engaged in what they're doing it keeps them going if you sit back and you start to relax they think they can do the same thing and so it's super important that your tone is super excited super like fast and just like This is what we're doing. This is what I need to hear. And if they aren't following what it was you were saying, start over and be like, nope, my expectation was that we did X, Y, and Z. Let's try this again, right? And making sure that they are doing what it was that you asked and that mood, that tone, and then that attention of what they're doing at all times is going to make sure that they stay on task. Now we're going to talk about the consistency as a key element. So When students know what to expect, they will be willing to participate in an activity. Consistency actually gives us a feeling of safety. And so when you have that consistency of they know what to expect during lesson time, this goes back to like what I said with transparency and um, the, uh, sorry, transparency and the clear expectations. It's so important because if they know what to expect from you, They feel safe. They're they know exactly what they're gonna do, how they're gonna do it, and it just gets rid of any feeling of like it gets rid of any feeling of being unsafe. And when we feel unsafe, we close up and our brains literally cannot learn if our needs are not being met, if we feel unsafe. And so just making sure that you have that consistency, whether that be 
when it is that you do your learning time. Maybe you always do learning time at this time because this is when your child is most engaged in this type of activity or whatever it is. Or maybe it's the consistency of just your expectations, which I would suggest that your expectations stay the same unless you need to change them. But discuss that with your child. I We need to change this expectation because X, Y, and Z, right? Um, but just making sure that you are consistent um, on how you begin, how you interact, how you participate in the learning, and this will help them to be more excited for their learning time. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is high expectations, because if you, it kind of goes with setting those clear expectations, but having the high expectations and making sure you follow through on them is so important because I have seen in my teaching years with different aids and things like that and they have the best hearts and they have the best interest of the child in mind but children know when they can just run you right over they know they know because they've done it and it works and so if you have an expectation you need to keep that expectation and there is no budging on that. And they know that there is a consequence. And let me tell you, it is rough in the beginning because I've had kids where, you know, we set this expectation and continually they try to get out of it over and over and over. And there have been learning times where literally we don't even get any so-called academic learning time done because we're strictly trying to just like, okay, we're going to work on one expectation today. This is our expectation for today. And I am telling you, I've had students where it's taking taken months for them to realize that they do get choices, but I will provide those choices for them. And we are still going to do our learning time And there's no getting out of it. Like we have to do our learning time and this is why. And reminding them, this is why we do this learning time. This is why, you know, this is the consequence of what happens when we don't have our learning time or when you are refusing to do this, right? Because they will. They'll try to do things like that. And there some days it might just be like a fight that you don't want to fight that day. And it's just like, you know what? They've had a really hard day today because of X, Y, and Z. We're just not going to do learning time today because I know it's not going to go well. And as a parent, that's something that you can do, right? You can say, we're not going to do it because I know of the kind of day they've had or whatever. But you need to make sure you follow through because <laughs> children will definitely walk over anyone they can if they can because they know that they can get away with it so hold them to those high expectations and make sure you follow through and that you guys both understand the consequences of what happens if we aren't participating in learning time or if we're not learning Um, I actually just recently saw something on Instagram and they were trying to get their child to read a word or whatever and they were asking them to do specific things and the child got this smirk on their face and they started to do the complete opposite of what the parent was asking them to do and the amount of times that I have seen that smirk as a teacher as well and it was because they knew like I can get away with this and there might not be any consequences for it. So just understanding that you need to have consequences if they aren't following through on their end Um, and it needs to be a natural consequence it can't just be something random that doesn't correlate because then they don't really get it so make sure it is some sort of natural consequence Um, and so for example that might be like okay you know we have our playtime set from this time to this time or whatever and if you are not able to learn during this time we may need to shift our playtime and now you've wasted your five minutes of or five minutes of that playtime or whatever it was I don't know exactly how you would want to do that or maybe we get five minutes less of our iPad time because you know we just spent five minutes doing nothing right so whatever it is but it's something that's a consequence that would would help them in the future to participate in their learning time. All right, so the very last thing I want to say is that teaching is an art form and it evolves through experimentation and adaptation. It really is something that you're not going to be very good at in the beginning and then you'll get better at through doing it. So give yourself grace. You might be like, that lesson sucked. Well, think about why did it suck? What was it about it that did not work? Was it your pacing? Was it that you just weren't, you know, in it? Like you weren't super excited about the learning time? Was it that your child was just having a really hard day that day? 
Um, Is it something that you're doing in the learning time that's really upsetting that child or making them more frustrated at that point in time? Is it that I need to have higher expectations? Was I not clear of my expectations? Do we need to have a discussion again about what our expectations are and what the consequences are if we aren't following those said expectations, right? So if something sucks, look at why it sucked and then try something different the next time. This is where the adaptation comes in. There were so many times as a teacher where I would teach a lesson. I thought it was going to be the most awesome lesson ever. I would teach the lesson and it just bombed. And why do I know it bombed? My kids were maybe not engaged in it. Maybe I, you know, I usually do like assessments and things like that or not like legit formal assessments, but informal assessments, which means that I'm just kind of watching as they're independently working to see like did they grasp the concept and (laughs) they were like struggling on that concept and they couldn't do it and I was like okay we need to start over again tomorrow I'm going to reteach this lesson but I'm going to do it in a different way so that I can hopefully you know be successful in teaching them this and that really is the reality of teaching you teach you informally assess and say, okay, did they learn what they needed to learn? And then you go back and you're like, nope, they didn't. Or maybe they did, but they weren't super engaged. Could I make it more fun the next time? Could I change it up a little bit better for the next time, right? You're always looking at how you can better that lesson. And then just make sure you're embracing a student-centric, respectful, and transparent learning time. Um, So what I mean by that is that the student should feel like they are um, kind of in charge of that lesson time. That's why I said like choices, right? If you provide them with choices, your your goal is that I need them to read and spell with A-Y words, but it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we get there, right? So as long as they, you know, that's why they can choose the materials they're using and they can, whatever. You could even give them a list of words and say, which words do you want to read? And they get to choose five words. Like there's so many ways that you can provide autonomy for them that will get rid of some of these issues with like what I was talking about where a kid just straight up refuses because they're going to want to do it because it now it's their choice right Um, and then like I said respectful and transparent it's so important that you're transparent with them on what they should accomplish by the end what does that look like and how do I know that I've accomplished it and understanding what my behavior is like when I'm in my learning time and then also just that mutual respect right like I never ever treated a student in a way that I would want them to treat me so like if I didn't want them to treat me that way I'm not going to treat them that way and it was this mutual respect that, like hey we're both humans we're on the same we're on the same play field right now okay we're level field or we're on the same level right so mutual respect that way and they knew that like if they did something that was like oh that really hurt my feelings like I would tell them because they can understand that right like just because I'm an adult doesn't mean that their actions don't mean anything to me right so if they were doing something like I've had kids you know grab papers and throw them off of the table and I'm like oh I am so sorry. I worked really hard on that and you just ruined my paper. That makes me really sad. And they actually start to like realize like, oh, like the way that I acted was inappropriate. And then we can talk like, why did we throw the papers? Oh, you're feeling this way? Oh, okay. Well, guess what? Next time, let's try to do it this way instead. Would that be a little bit better for you okay as long as we're doing what I've asked where we're reading our words then I don't care how you do it you can do it that way that's totally fine right so just getting them to understand that hey we're on the same same team we're at the same level here like I'm here to help you and I want you to succeed and it really does shift your learning time when they understand that because now you're both humans on the same level and it's it it just is so much more helpful when you have that mindset. But like I said, just make sure you give yourself grace when you are teaching lessons and learning this new skill of teaching your child. Um, And then really thinking about your own style and just as you progress through this and you do it and you try different things and eventually you'll get to a point where it is like a well-oiled machine like they know what to expect they come they do and we're done 
right? Like it's super fast. And that is really the one thing that I would just keep hounding is please be transparent and set those high expectations and follow through. Those are like the three biggest things that I'm going to tell you because that's how I found success in my classroom. I had a lot of hard students in my classroom because I was really good with those students. And those were like three of the biggest, well, four of the biggest things is I also created a really good relationship with them. Um, And so we were kind of like, I don't know, we had a mutual respect for each other as well. So I hope this was helpful. I hope you got some action steps and some things that you can implement um, during your learning time. But thank you for listening and I hope for your continued success.